Today is the feast of St. John of Massa, and the, just quickly about him, he's an interesting character. As a young man born in the, the, about the year 1160, his parents were good Christian parents. They cared for his soul, they raised him to practice virtue, and they had made sure that he was properly educated in the, the, the truths of the faith and the, and the things of, of a regular education. But at the same time, they kind of had a bit of, of that uh, aristocratic aspect to them, that they wanted him to be well-rounded in all of the, the niceties in life, too. And so at his school, he did, um, you know, nothing wrong or bad about them, but he, he partook in various arts and various other types of activities as well, fencing and, and horse riding and all of these upper uh, class activities that were, were kind of rounded him out as a person. And, but because of the fact that he was so grounded in, in virtue, he didn't let the trappings that often come with kind of that uh, being part of, of, a, of a higher class and learning the genteel ways of life to be a corrupting agent for him. Some people would allow that to be a source of pride. Some people would allow that to be uh, a source of uh, where they would have contempt for, for others and violate charity. But the John of Matha, he was the opposite. He so did those things because it rounded him out as a person, but he, at every opportunity, took advantage to go and do acts of true charity for his fellow men. One of the things as a young man or older boy, young adult, uh, what he would oftentimes do is he'd go every single week to one of the hospitals and he'd go and help care for the sick there just out of the goodness of his heart of practicing, you know, being truly virtuous, being truly charitable. And he would take on some of the lowliest of jobs at the hospital on a volunteer basis. He most especially enjoyed when he had the opportunity to actually clean out and rebandage the wounds of those who were hurt because he felt that he knew that that was a truly a, a direct action of caring uh, for somebody else. Well, as a, he continued to progress, progress in, <clears throat> in his virtue, he eventually knew that uh, God was calling him to something higher. And so he got, got, he studied, uh, for and eventually was ordained to the priesthood. But he always had this burning desire to devote himself completely to works of charity. And in that time, he saw his opportunity of point of divine providence arise before him. He started to heal, hear of the saint, uh, of the, the, at that time living man, Felix of Valois. And, uh, he realized that this man had, he heard that this man wanted to do work for the ransoming of people enslaved, whether they were in captive, um, for, for any reason, but most especially those who were uh, captured by the Muslims to liberate those Christians who were being forced into slavery under the Muslim uh, under Muslim in invasion, and that they, they, they do all this work to go out and to liberate them so that they didn't and weren't in danger of apostasy first and foremost, and secondarily that they weren't subject against their will uh, to this great hardship of life. And so Felix of Valois, he wanted to, to, to form some sort of group to do this. And, to, and John of Matha was, a, was to him a, a true gift from God. It allowed him to have the beginnings of what really was a community. And they formed together and they were uh, eventually approved as a new order. And they were under the title of, most, of the Most Holy Trinity. And that was their duty. They would go out and they would... Uh, ransom captives, and they would actually, if they weren't able to pay the entire ransom of all of the, the Christian slaves, then they would even go to the point of exchanging themselves in return for those who are Christian captives. And the, the, during their 
And when they weren't out doing that, they were living a life of great penance. They were doing all these penitential actions. They were praying a lot. And they were almost living a semi-hermitage of a lifestyle, very cloistered, a very uh, away from the world. And they'd have common points of prayer, but they would uh, for just to live a very penitential life all for the good of the, those souls, especially those Christian captives. Well, John of Matha, he went on several trips to, to ransom captives. He ransomed several hundred Christians from the, the clutches of, of slavery under the Mohammedans. And uh, it says that the, he eventually, after his last trip, that it, he, that combined with all of the penances that he was performing, eventually his, his health gave out. And he died at about the age of uh, 53 or so uh, years old. And, uh, and when we look at it, how, what was it that he died of? He died of a complete exhaustion in the way of charity, in the way of the love of God via the love and the assistance that he gave to his neighbor. And for us, what a great model he gives. Now that doesn't mean we're going to live in a hermitage and go, uh, sell, you know, exchange ourselves into slavery to, to ransom Muslims, but, uh, uh, captive Christians in, in Muslim territories, perhaps. But what it does mean when we look at ourselves, our number one inclination is to measure how much we give to ourselves. We tend to, to always want to hold back and to have some reserve whether it be in the mode of charity, whether it be in the mode of prayer, whether it be in the mode of, of sacrifice, of penance, or these things. And uh, to a certain extent, it's necessary. There are aspects of prudence that go into that. We have people that depend upon us. We have duties in our life that we have to fulfill. But perhaps we can see areas that we hold back too much in that regard. Because we are afraid of that inconvenience and that and that uh, suffering that it, that it sometimes entails to really give of our substance and some sort of means of charity that is ultimately towards that service and love of God. And with that type of reflection, when we see somebody who is called to su such a high degree of sanctity, and how did he get there? By completely exhausting every aspect of himself in that way of charity. We can see for our own lives, an ordinary life, a life that is that is 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 not called to that ultimate sacrifice of the last breath that we have um, towards uh, towards giving towards somebody in captivity or anything like that. But nonetheless, we are called to be to end our lives in charity, because at its foundation, it is the love of God. And if we are increasing in loving God and serving God, and we're increasing in our devotion to, to in, in, in the, our capacity to be able to, to, to perform that end to our best ability, then, nece then necessarily we're going to find ourselves giving more towards our neighbor as well, and caring more about them as well. And we'll find ourselves giving more time over to our prayer and more time and effort into our sacrifices. Why? Because it has that ultimate end of the love of God. And yes, it may not be due to exhaustion that we die, but it should be that last thought and last effort on our minds and on our lips is the love and service of God, because we've practiced it regularly throughout our days during our life. And that is how we sanctify ourselves, just like St. John of Mather did. We give each day all the opportunities we can towards loving God and loving neighbor. One commandment truly united together with those two parts. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.